The Rathskeller and the Rose by O. Henry. Miss Posey Carrington had earned her success. She began life handicapped by the family name of Boggs in the small town known as Cranberry Corners. At the age of 18, she had acquired the name of Carrington and a position in the chorus of a metropolitan burlesque company. Thence upward, she had ascended by the legitimate and delectable steps of Broiler, member of the famous Dickie Bird Octet in the successful musical comedy Fudge and Fellows, leader of the potato bug dance in Falderall, and at length to the part of the maid Toinette in the king's bathrobe, which captured the critics and gave her her chance. And when we come to consider Miss Carrington, she is in the heyday of flattery, fame, and fizz, and that astute manager, heir Timothy Goldstein, was her signature to ironclad papers that she will star in the coming season in Diedrich's new play, Paresis by Gaslight. Well, promptly there came to heir Timothy a capable 20th century young character actor by the name of Highsmith, who besought engagement as sole hay tosser, the comic and chief male character, a uh, part in Paresis by Gaslight. Well, my boy, said Goldstein, take the part if you can get it. Miss Carrington won't listen to any of my suggestions. She has turned down half a dozen of the best imitators of the rural dub in the city. Well, she declares she won't set a foot on the stage unless hay tosser is the best that can be raked up. She was raised in a village, you know, and when a Broadway orchid sticks a straw in his hair and tries to call himself a clover blossom, well, she's on, all right. I asked her in a sarcastic vein if she thought Denman Thompson would make any kind of a show in the part. Oh, no, says she. I don't want him or John Drew or Jim Corbett or any of these swell actors that don't know a turnip from a turnstile. I want the real article. So, my boy, if you want to play Soul Hay Tosser, you'll have to convince Miss Carrington. Luck be with you. Highsmith took the train the next day for Cranberry Corners. He remained in that forsaken and inanimate village for three days. He found the Boggs family and corkscrewed their history into the third and fourth generation. He amassed the facts and the local color of Cranberry Corners. The village had not grown as rapidly as had Miss Carrington. Now, the actor estimated it had suffered as few actual changes since the departure of its solitary follower of Thespis had on a stage, upon which four years is supposed to have elapsed. He absorbed Cranberry Corners and returned to the city of chameleon changes. It was in the Rathskeller that Highsmith made the hit of his histrionic career. There's no need to name the place. There is but one Rathskeller where you could hope to find Miss Posey Carrington after a performance of the King's Bathrobe. There was a jolly small party at one of the tables that drew many eyes. Miss Carrington, petite, marvelous, bubbling, electric, fame drunken, shall be named first. Eric Goldstein follows, sonorous and curly haired, heavy and a trifle anxious, as some bear that had caught somehow a butterfly in his claws. Next, a man condemned to a newspaper, sad, corded, armed, analyzing for press agents to draw every sentence that was poured over him, eating his a la Newberg in the silence of greatness. To conclude, a youth with parted hair, a name that is ochre to red journals and gold on the back of a supper check. These sat at a table while the musicians played, while waiters moved in the mazy performance of their duties with their backs toward all who desired their service. And all was bizarre and merry, because it was nine feet below the level of the sidewalk. At 11.45, a bean entered the Raskeller. The first violin perceptibly flatted the C that should have been natural. The clarinet blew a bubble instead of a grace note. Miss Carrington giggled, and the youth with parted hair swallowed an olive seed. Exquisitely and irreproachably rural was the new entry. A lank, disconcerted, hesitating young man it was, flaxen-haired, gaping of mouth, awkward, stricken to misery by the lights and company. His clothing was butternut, with a bright blue tie showing four inches of bony wrist and a white socked ankle. He upset a chair, sat in another one, curled a foot around a table leg, and cringed at the approach of a waiter. Oh, well, you may fetch me a glass of lager beer, he said in response to the discreet questioning of the servitor. The eyes of the rascaler were upon him. He was as fresh as a collard and as ingenious as a hayrake. He let his eye rove about the place as one who regards big-eyed hogs in the potato patch. 
while his gaze rested at length upon Miss Carrington. He rose and went to her table with a lateral shining smile and a blush of pleased trepidation. "'Well, how are you, Miss Posey?' he said in accents not to be doubted. "'Don't you remember me, Bill Summers? The Summers is that lived in the black back of the blacksmith shop. Well, I reckon I growed up some since you left Cranberry Corners.' Liza Perry allowed I might see in the city while I was here. You know, Liza, married Benny Stanfield, and, well, she says. Ah, oh, say, interrupted Miss Carrington brightly. Liz Perry is never married. What, oh, the freckles of her. Well, married in June, grinned the gossip, and living in the old Tatum place. Well, Ham Riley professed religion. Old Mrs. Blythers sold her place to Captain Spooner, and the youngest Waters girl run away with the music teacher. The courthouse burned up last March and your Uncle Wiley was elected constable. Matilda Hoskins died from running a needle in her hand, and, well, Tom Beadle is a court in Sally Lathrop. They say he don't miss a night, but what he's setting on her porch. The wall-eyed thing, claimed Miss Carrington with asperity. Why, Tom Beadle once... Well, say, you folks, excuse me a while. This is an old friend of mine. Mr. What was it? Yes, Mr. Summers. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, Mr. Ricketts, Mr... What's yours? Johnny'll do. Come on over here and tell me some more. She swept him into an isolated table in a corner. Herr Goldstein shrugged his fat shoulders and beckoned to the waiter. The newspaper man brightened a little and mentioned absinthe. The youth with parted hair was plunged into melancholy. The guests of the rascaler laughed, clinked glasses, and enjoyed the comedy that Posey Carrington was treating them to after her regular performance. A few cynical ones whispered, press agent, and smiled wisely. Posey Carrington laid her dimpled and desirable chin upon her hands and forgot her audience, a faculty that had won her laurels. I don't seem to recollect any Bill Summers, she said, thoughtfully gazing straight into the innocent blue eyes of the rustic young man. But I know the Summers is all right. I guess there ain't many changes in the old town. You see any of my folks lately? And then Highsmith played his trump. The part of Sol Haytosser called for pathos as well as comedy. Well, Miss Carrington should see that he could do that as well. Miss Posey, said Bill Summers, I was up to your folks' house just two or three days ago. Well, there ain't many changes to speak of. The lilac bush by the kitchen window is over a foot higher, and the elm in the front yard died and had to be cut down. And yet it don't seem the same place that it used to be. Well, how's Ma? asked Miss Mar Carrington. While well, she was settin' by the front door, crocheting a lamp mat when I saw her last, said Bill. She's older than she was, Miss Posey, but everything in the house looked just the same. Your ma asked me to set down. Now don't touch that willow rocker, William, says she. It ain't been moved since Posey left, and that's the apron she was hemming laying over the arm of it, just as she flung it. I'm in hopes, she goes on, that Posey'll finish running out that hem some day. Miss Carrington beckoned peremptorily to a waiter. A pint of extra dry, she ordered briefly, and give the check to Goldstein. While well, the sun was shining in the door, went on the chronicler from Cranberry, and your ma was setting right in it. Well, I asked her if she hadn't better move back a little. Well, William, says she, when I get sucked down and looking down the road, I can't bear to move. Never a day, says she, but what I set here every minute that I can spare and watch over them pounds for Posy. Well, she went way down that road in the night, for we seen her little shoe tracks in the dust. And something tells me she'll come back that way again when she's weary of the world and begins to think about her old mother. When I was coming away, concluded Bill, I pulled this off the bush by the front steps. I thought maybe I might see you in the city, and I knowed you like something from the old home. He took from his pocket a rose, a drooping yellow velvet odorous rose that hung its bead in the foul atmosphere of that tainted Rathskeller, like a virgin bowing before the hot breath of the lions in a Roman arena. Miss Carrington's penetrating but musical laugh rose above the orchestra's rendering of bluebells. Oh, say, she cried with glee, ain't those pokey places the limit? I just know that two hours at Cranberry Corners would give me the horrors now. Well, I'm awful glad to have seen you, Mr. Summers. Guess I'll bustle around to the hotel now and get my beauty sleep. She thrust the yellow rose into the bosom of her wonderful, dainty silken garments, stood up and nodded imperiously at Herr Goldstein. Her three companions and Bill Summers attended her to the cab, and when her flounces and streamers were all safely tucked inside, she dazzled them with au revoirs from the shining eyes and teeth. 
Come around to the hotel and see me, Bill, before you leave the city, she called as the glittering cab rolled away. Well, Highsmith, still in his makeup, went with Harry Goldstein to a cafe booth. Bright idea, eh? asked the smiling actor. Ought to land soul hate tosser for me, don't you think? The little lady never once tumbled. Well, I didn't hear your conversation, said Goldstein, but your makeup and acting was okay. Here's to your success. Better call Miss Carrington early tomorrow and strike her for the part. I don't see how she can keep you from being satisfied with your exhibition of ability. At 11.45 a.m. on the next day, Highsmith, handsome, dressed in the latest mode, confident with a fuchsia in his buttonhole, set up his card to Miss Carrington in her select apartment hotel. He was shown up and received by the actress's French maid. I am sorry, said Mademoiselle Hortense, but I didn't say this to all. It is with great regret Miss Carrington have canceled all engagements on the stage and have returned to live in that how-you-call-town cranberry corner.